Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and it's not a solo episode today. We are joined by a guest, and it's none other than well-respected political commentator, Jacob C. Lloyd. Jake, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Scott. Thank you so much for having me on Highly Respected. I've missed it. It's been a long time. I know. We've been wondering where you've been, but we found him and he's back on the show. Uh, we, I chose Jake for this specific purpose. I mean, my producer reached out to him. You know, I have a whole production team, of course, here. And, you know, we thought it would be a great subject to have him on because there's been a lot of talk about Anglo-Saxons recently. And it's all over this, uh, which now scrapped America First Caucus that was uh, co-chaired or was co-founded by Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar. But both of them said, oh, we're not doing this anymore for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but in this, this founding document they had, they said they aimed to uphold the Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Saxon political traditions. And this caused a lot of controversy. So, Jake, why do you think people are so offended by the mere mention of Anglo-Saxon political traditions? What are they? Well, I think people are most offended because we're the best and they have been trying to keep us down for so long. Anglo-Saxons so are the most oppressed white people of all. That is a fact. And that's true when you talk to liberals. It's even true when you talk to other, you know, other people in our world, it's, you know, people hate us because they wish they were us. That's the truth. But that is true. There is a lot of Anglophobia on the timeline right now. Everyone is like very Anglo, anti-Anglo, and it's particularly even on our side. There's some people who are imagining like the British Empire as the root of all evil. British is specifically, it's something in their genes, like the Anglo-Saxons themselves and their genes or something wrong with them. And there's even this like uh, theory goes back to even like, writers far past uh, right-wing Twitter, like Hilaire Bellick and um, G.K. Chesterton were both anti-Saxons, even though they were Anglos themselves. They thought that everything wrong with Britain and Europe was due to the Germanic influence, and they, uh, they didn't like the Germanic influence of the English uh, for a variety of reasons. And they, <laughs> they're very, they try to claim that everything came from the Latins and the Romans and nothing, and nothing came from these evil Germans, which the Anglo-Saxons were descended yeah. from. So everyone, even on our side, everyone sees, uh, something wrong with the Anglos. Uh, I can understand like hating on the British empire and the Brits. I mean, if you look at the UK today, it's, it's so cringe, yeah. but <laughs> there is this refusal to acknowledge that, you know, people primarily, predominantly from the British Islands founded America and they brought their traditions and culture with them. And that's what informs what America is today. And it's a simple fact we can't acknowledge, like the fact that you're going to put Anglo-Saxon political traditions in a political document is somehow some evil nativist dog whistle or a sign of white supremacy. You, They really think that you should have written like Aryan there. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so I mean, it's um, well. It literally it's the thing interesting that we've moved to this point where yeah. we can't even acknowledge our Anglo-Saxon heritage. And the thing about it, the the thing that these, it's which is why it's so. I mean, I'm funny in kind of a really sick way is that the Anglo-Saxon political traditions that these people are are now screaming about are the very things that they are so up in arms about over things like the the. Capitol riot on the 6th. They're like, our sacred institutions. Like, who do you think built those sacred institutions that you talk about? Like, who do you think constructed our constitution, our, our government, and, and wrote the constitution? And where do you think those ideas come from? They're like distinctly Anglo Saxon. They're not, our, despite the, you know, the architectural LARPing and stuff that we do here in America, which is fine. I don't have a problem with it, but. Like, <clears throat> we don't have a Greek democracy. We don't even, you know, it's like in certain ways it is modeled very loosely, modeled after the Roman Republic. But by and large, our political traditions come from the Anglo-Saxons. They come from England. They come from Britain. And so it's just very funny that just the, the word, the word, the phrase Anglo-Saxon is what makes them so mad because it it does denote that there is a, you know, a connection with these ideas to a very specific people. And it's not, you know, it's not Africans. It's not, you know, Native American Indians or whatever. It's not any of that. That's what, what upsets them so bad because, you know, these traditions are what they claim to love, what they claim to defend. 
Yeah, and they now try to claim that, like, oh, this actually comes from the Iroquois uh, Confederation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, and, the, and the Iroquois <laughs> had, like, a completely different system, and not a single founding father said, like, yeah, we relied on this. And the Iroquois uh, Confederacy, or I'm probably, I forget what the exact term for it. I mean, they clearly didn't use the, the English term for it, but it was not, a, it was more like uh, something uh, along the lines of like the EU or something like these mm -hmm. are like independent nations that are just coming together as a loose alliance. It's not oh, any way yeah. what was based, our nation yeah. was based on. And even the revolution itself, like the, they felt, the colonists felt they weren't, their rights as Englishmen weren't being respected. And this was like a large justification for the revolution. It wasn't just some that we created these ideas out of thin air in a vacuum. Like Thomas Jefferson just one day thought that all men are created equal. And thus, this is what we're fighting about. We're fighting for an idea as like a Lincoln, pro I saw a new Lincoln project ad, which is still around for some reason. They have not been shut down due to pedophilia <laughs> um, and massive corruption and grifting, but they just released an ad where it's like some gruff voice is like, America's the only nation that was founded on an idea. I was like, well, actually, every fucking communist state was founded on an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what was the Soviet <laughs> Union based off of? It, yeah, communism. Yeah. That's like an idea. So it's a putting us in the same league with communists uh, when you say our nation is built on an idea. And these guys were not building it on an idea. Like, mm -hmm. those rights were you know, flesh and blood to them. Those mattered in real life. You know, that that like that meant how much money they were getting taxed, whether they had a right over how their communities were led and whether they had even a right over the way they practiced their <clears throat> faith because they also worried that the English were going to totally wipe away their rights and impose Anglicanism. Upon mm -hmm. them. Uh, you may have enjoyed that, but a lot of the low church <laughs> Protestants who read right. the revolution weren't happy with it so there's this whole thing that we can't acknowledge that we have any dissent um to our democracy that that is as you were mentioning that is tied to a specific people or culture and we're just supposed to ignore that uh you know our and the only time that they will you know allude to this is to say it was bad like the revolution american mm -hmm. revolution was fought for white supremacy but these ideas are still good these guys are evil white supremacists and racists and slave traders etc uh, but their ideas are great. Like we just we just care when they said all men are created equal, and we think everything is evil right. and that. And that's like our bizarre uh, conception well, of American history now. Yeah, and it's like you know I you know honestly I might be in one of the last you know uh, classes, one of the last generations of kids to go through school and be taught this. Overall, I mean states vary with the education system and stuff, but you know it, it's when I was in middle school. They taught us about the, you know, the continuity from the Magna Carta and the development of English common law all the way to the present day, you know, including the Constitution and all of these different things and stuff. So there was there. It was like literally 10 years ago that we were like, yes, this is an Anglo-Saxon or this is an English tradition. And now it's, you know, now it's just the idea that, like you said, the founders made up funny. I was actually, you know, <laughs> I was on TikTok a couple hours ago, if you can believe it. And I was watching this great Anglo-Saxon tradition. That yes. TikTok. Yeah. But it was, so I scrolled through and there was this, I don't know how true this is, but it's, but what it says is true. Even if this interview is real or not, they said that there was like this guy, he was one of the, one of the last guys to be alive that fought uh, at the battle of Lexington and battles of Lexington and Concord. And so he was giving an interview in like the 1840s or something to some newspaper. And they were asking him like why they did it basically. And of course this guy is just, you know, answering questions. And so the, the gist of it is that he wasn't like fighting because he had read, you know, um, John Locke or, or Thomas Paine or anything like that. But the idea was that they had been governing themselves. They had been living their life a certain way. And suddenly uh, the British government was not respecting that. And then they wanted to come take their guns. So they were just like, we're not going to do that. We've been living this way. Our fathers and our grandfathers lived this way. And so the political idea that they probably cared most about was not, you know, limited government or classical liberalism or any of these other things that people, that the political minds of that time argued about, but they probably cared a whole lot uh, about the line where it says, where it talks about securing these rights for them and their posterity. And so there absolutely is, um, that's what was important to them. It wasn't these, you know, these 
ideas. Ideas really don't yeah, mean pe- a lot. Yeah, people don't really fight and die necessarily for abstract ideas that they can't really articulate. It's like, <laughs> yes, I'm dying for uh, the right to free market or I'm mm-hmm. dying for the right to, you know, I guess, uh, have a jury trial, you know, which I mean, we know, which we may uh, lose that in a few <laughs> in a few years. I mean, a lot of these rights we're going to leave and lose. Like, that's the funny thing is all the people are saying, like, our nation is built on an idea. They want to get rid of all these <laughs> ideas right. that were implanted in the in the Constitution, like right to bear arms. We can't have that. Freedom of religion, can't have that because you may be anti-gay. Freedom of speech, oh, you that might be hate speech. Uh, you know, they it's like everything that was like included in there, they just want to get rid of. And, and even we're going to talk about this later with the Derek Chauvin trial. You know, all these like senior legal analysts are going off about how like outraged at the way a normal trial is being conducted that they would dare um, – question what the state is telling them so right the, is, so the the people who are the most insistent on like the abstract ideas want to get rid of those abstract ideas anyway and at, at the end of the day america is just about the pursuit of profit and diversity and, and tolerance and that's it and that's apparently what we're founded on but they they have a tough time squaring that circle with the founders, because I mean, the founders uh, were clearly not about these values, and they clearly, even though they didn't necessarily articulate it in the clearest terms uh, in all of their writing, they didn't necessarily. They saw America as like a united people that was largely homogenous. They acknowledged that there were some elements uh, from other places in Europe there uh, that were mixing in, but it was primarily rooted from the British Isles. And those people who are from France or Germany or Sweden or wherever were mixing in and becoming Anglified themselves. And they saw blacks and Indians as others. I mean, and, and that's that literally like clear- one of the most compelling arguments in you know the Federalist Papers, which explain the reason why the Constitution is a good idea, uh, make arguments for it. Literally, was that we are like one people of the same heritage. We share this same land, and thus it's a good idea for us to do this together rather than separately. Yeah, and I think for most of our history, everyone acknowledged that they, whether regardless of where the roots were in Europe they came and they became Anglified themselves. But there has been this long time hatred for the Anglo and Anglos themselves. I mean, WASP became popularized in the 1950s and a lot of the white ethnics were were rebelling against these evil WASP who were ruling our country. And at this, even at the time that everyone saw that our elites were governed by this WASP tyranny, uh, you know, the WASP were getting supplanted uh, as the elites by Ellis Islanders. And mm-hmm. this is process been continued, but the wasp it, it, it's a pejorative in our country. It's not nobody proudly describes himself, unless ironically, as a wasp. Right. I mean, maybe the band wasp is like one of the few examples, but even <laughs> then, uh, the band didn't really say it stood for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. It was like a cheeky way, and I don't think any of the band members were uh, wasps themselves. <laughs> but you know, this is this is the nature that we're a very anti-Anglo country, and it's come to the day to the point where you know none of these people most whites in this country i mean much less the non-whites in this country see themselves as non-anglos and this is reflected in the census i think in the 1980 census the the largest percentage of our the largest share of whites and saying where the roots were from were saying english like english or british american mm-hmm. that was like the number one category <laughs> but 20 years later or it may even be 20, 30 years later, the largest percentage of, for ethnicity in America is German. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it was like it was like 49 million people are saying that they have British ancestry, English ancestry, and then 48 million saying they're German. Well, that number for the Germans about to say, stay the same, but the British and English like totally dissipated to like 20 million. <laughs> And it's like, well, where are those people? I mean, those people just suddenly die out? No, those people either began calling themselves simply as American or they're identifying either with their German or Irish ancestry or some other ancestry that's more unique and exotic. Because no one very, I mean, you rarely meet somebody who describes themselves as like, oh, my background is English. Like I'm an English American. Like nobody calls themselves as an English American. And very few people call themselves a Scottish American 
or uh, or British American. So these so people instead tie themselves to what other white ethnicity or European ethnic group yeah, that they feel like is more exotic. So Irish. maybe somebody's like sixty percent, sixty or seventy percent British uh, heritage, but they have like they have like some German grandparents. So they decide that they're they mark themselves as German American on the census. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so like that, really sad, honestly. I mean, because again, this is our culture and you know this is it feels like we had this you know these are things that we were saying in like 2016 or whatever like it's like we should be allowed to have our own culture but that's not just true of white people generally it's like true of anglos too this is the next that's this is right. the next civil rights it movement. is okay to be anglo-saxon it we is need to say it proudly <laughs> I am proud to be Anglo. Yeah, but this is the next. This is the next. We're coming out of the closet movement. as a. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm Anglo and I'm proud. I'm done. I'm done being ashamed of it for. Yeah, we're coming yeah. out of. Uh, I don't know what is like a, the wardrobe. I don't know what's like no. the stereotypical <laughs> like yeah. Anglo like <laughs> coming out of the Hobbit hole and declaring <laughs> we're, we're Anglo's. Yeah, coming you know, out of the Shire. Yeah, but nobody says – I said that on the recent census. I've made a point like I am – because now you can list multiple. So I said like mm. I'm Scottish and English. Yeah. Um, and I guess that was just like a point of pride. I would have just said English-American. But even like those who are saying themselves as simply as American, that is a sign that they're assimilating to our Anglo culture. So there is something going forward as to what – you know, the average white American sees themselves. I think the one thing that, like, we we talk about a lot of the people on this and right talk about is, like, whites have no sense of, like, in America, have, like, no sense of, like, racial uh, solidarity or, or mm -hmm. ethnic identity in America, but they don't really have it. It's just, like, they see their skin color. I mean, they generally identify with the mainstream culture. Uh, you know, they identify with sports teams or and they watch, you know, the big movies. And, you know, it's something that's like, you know, very materialistic and it's not very, it's very shallow type of identity. Like you're not going to go to war for uh, Hollywood or the New York Yankees or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So on that point, there's not like this deep seated organic culture for like the average white American who they may identify with some ethnic heritage, you know, whether it's Italian or Irish or German or whatever. But, you know, there's no real connection to that. And their ancestor could have come here in like 1800. So they don't really have a connection to that. And they're just kind of stuck there with this identity that, you know, what does being white means? It means being a bad dancer. It means being uh, having white privilege. Uh, it just means being a dork in the general culture. And but like most of the other groups in this country, I mean, black America means something that has a serious culture. And that's like something that's not only you know, it's supported by the institutions and by the powers that be. And it is like something that they identify. Like they they know what being black American means. Uh, Hispanic American is like a generic category that, but most of the people <laughs> identify with their na nation of origin, whether it's Cuba or Mexico. And even Asians now, which it's the most like made up category, which like <laughs> somebody who's like Korean and somebody who's like a Bengali are somehow the same. And even though they're come from completely cult different cultures, but Asians realize that it's it's it helps their ability to gain power and advance in society by pretending that Asian Americans are a distinct ethnic group with their own little uh, culture and interests. When in fact, like these people, even like Koreans and Chinese, have nothing, have very little in common, you know, right. or don't have much in common. But they'll pretend that they're all on the same team. But whites are just told that like they're generic human beings that. Uh, completely bereft of culture, ethnicity, or identity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's funny. That's actually funny because it is like, what's the acronym? Asian American Pacific Islander or oh, whatever. Oh, AAPI. As, yeah. if, Pacific as if Pacific Islanders, Islanders are anything like Chinese people or <laughs> like <laughs> Indians. They're just like, oh, they're all just the same people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, it makes sense. I mean, it was created by the census as just a designation, but they're now clinging to it because they realize that that makes them right. non white. And that is a that's a status. That's a high status in our society to be anything but white. And they want to cling to that. So they'll just like, yeah, we're we're proud to be AAPI. And I was like, so Samoans and like Vietnamese and Koreans are now like all together. <laughs> but like yeah. if like two, but like Germans and like 
British people who have lived here for hundreds and hundreds of years have nothing in common. They're just like generic human beings. They're just individuals, as they like to say. But a mm -hmm. lot of this is like white Americans are very like love to cling to their individualism and they don't like to see themselves as a part of any group. They just want to be judged by by the content of their uh, their character, not the right. not the color of their skin. You know, they they're more diehard adherents to uh, Martin Luther King's thing than anyone <laughs> else and uh, to their own misfortune. And nobody else, nobody else shares that, and they don't understand why nobody gets it. So I, but I think that whites will adopt some type of identity. I don't think it will be based around being called white because there is like a there's a certain uh, great stigma around that. But it will be some type of term that they will reflect on well because the other <laughs> all these people hate them, and we're built on a society of anti-white racism. And I think that will someday, you know lead to greater consciousness of a collective identity and will lead to more people advocating for group interests. So, and maybe that day we'll have actually have an America first caucus, right. but, you know, moving on to the point of the actual like hullabaloo around the America first caucus is that it was shut down. Why do you think it, you know, they announced it on Friday or they leaked it on Friday and then by Saturday they had totally scrapped it. Why do you think that this occurred in such a quick time? Frame? <laughs> um, I, well, so it clearly, you know, the reasons that they gave, I think the, you know, they're being honest when they say that, uh, I don't know. So look, okay. So they took it down because of the backlash, obviously. And I think that a lot of times conservatives, for whatever reason, they get backlash about stuff. If there was no backlash, I don't think that these people, these congressmen would be like, no, 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 take out, take out the word Anglo-Saxon. That is not what I'm about. I don't think that they would actually care, but they get backlash and then they convince themselves that there was actually... Well, no, no, no. We actually didn't want that in there for X, Y, Z reason because of this or that. And so they got a lot of hate. People started freaking out and they chose to take it down because that's not what we're about. Well, that's not the message that we wanted to send. Um, yeah. But I don't understand why. I don't understand why we're still doing this, especially people who are already. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene is like. <laughs> She's effectively neutered in Congress. There's like not really anything that can, she can do because the Republicans don't like her because she makes them seem crazy. The Democrats don't like her because, you know, she's <laughs> she's like based and red pilled on like aliens and <laughs> like and QAnon and the Illuminati yeah. and the Illuminati. So they're like, no, she's too dangerous. Shut her down. You know, she's going to wake them up. She's going to wake America up. And so they shut her down, but she's like removed from, so she's not going to like author any bills that are going to get, you know, change America. She's not on any committees. They stripped her of all of that stuff. She's basically a leper. She's total persona non grata. So why she pulled out of this? I don't know. Like, it's one thing if they just said, oh, we're going to change our statement of beliefs to remove Anglo-Saxon. Okay, that's cringe, but whatever. Why do you have to pull out of this thing um, when you're already like basically a political untouchable? I don't get it. And the same thing uh, to, a, to a slightly lesser degree with Paul Gosar. I mean, he spoke at AFPAC. He, this is, you know, there are a lot of people in the Republican Party and all of the Democrats that want to take this guy out politically. So it's like, why are we, you know, the cat's already out of the bag. We know that you're, you know, we know that you're America first. So why are you going to pull out of this? I don't understand why we're still doing that. I understand that they're the, the impulse, but I don't get it. Yeah. I, I, in some ways get it. I mean, I'm not supporting it, but I actually think I, my theory is that the house freedom caucus had told like Gosar and Marjorie mm -hmm. Taylor green, like, what the hell is this? We already have the house freedom caucus. There's not really a need for this. They would have said, I still think there would have been a need. And House Freedom, the House Freedom Caucus is getting much better. I think, you know, when it was first formed, it was about like simple Tea Party ideas. But now it's like mostly Trump stuff. They're like huge Trump supporters. They're all about immigration. They're mm -hmm. all about like challenging, you know, election fraud. And most of most of our issues, like the House Freedom Caucus is standing pretty firm. And mm -hmm. they're a pretty powerful caucus. Uh, and they may have said, like, you know, what's the point of this? Like, we don't like this and like you need to shut this down mm -hmm. and we may we may not defend you if you keep, you know, trying to start a rival caucus. And I think also the Republican leadership told every Republican, like, you are not joining this 
and thus it was just going to be left to just Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, one member caucus, mm -hmm. and that wouldn't have been too good. I mean, it's a it's a setback, but at the same time, you have to look as like the House Freedom Caucus is moving in a more positive direction. The real black pill is seeing how Republican leaders totally capitulated to the liberal media frenzy about this and are like republican party is just the party for opportunity for all people we oppose nativist dog whistles nativism has no place in this and it's like kevin mccarthy and liz cheney <laughs> were saying this and like adam kinzinger who should be expelled from his own caucus was like demanding that like all members be expelled uh from the caucus and and purged from their committees if they join this and it's like Kinzinger is likely not going to keep his seat because that his his district is going to be gerrymandered in in Illinois to favor Democrats. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why do you have to listen to him? But like the media has to pay to pay his attention to him. So um, I kind of understand why it happened. It's it it's it's really lame. But yeah, I don't. I think the real problem had is that they weren't going to recruit other members due to pressure from Republican leadership and probably House Freedom Caucus thought that there's no point to this. And uh, when they already have the House Freedom Caucus, which, you know, we would like House Freedom Caucus to be much better. We would like them to be the America First Caucus, but mm -hmm. they are doing much better than they were, you know, a few years ago. And they defend Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and Mo Brooks and other members when they get involved in controversy. So, you know, you don't want to attack them too much, but it's a right. lame situation. Um, it's still funny. It's still pretty good that we have this. Uh, hilarious convers national conversation over Anglo-Saxons, um, but it's unfortunate that it didn't lead to the result of a creation of a totally based and red-pilled caucus within the GOP. So I guess that's our thoughts on that. Moving along to our second topic that involves Capitol Hill, uh, but of course the Capitol protest, is that the main linchpin of the January 6th narrative that this was an armed insurrectionist mob that murdered countless people and murdered innocent people, even though there's only one person that they could ever claim that they murdered, uh, that turns out that wasn't a murder at all. Officer Brian Sicknick, who, by the way, was a Trump supporter himself and apparently followed QAnon accounts on Parler. So he's probably, so in all accounts, probably a very good person, a good yeah. guy and his family. <laughs> his family are clearly like good people because they always kept urging the media to stop politicizing this and to stop attacking Trump supporters. And it turned out he died not of anything caused by a January 6th protest, no fire extinguisher to the head, no allergic reaction to bear spray. He died of stroke and it was, you know, totally died of natural causes. So it was no murder at all. And this is after a three or four or nearly four month <clears throat> investigation into his death. So I think that it's pretty foolproof and there is no way to dispute it. Uh, do you think there will be any reckoning or any change in how the media and the authorities perceive January 6th due to this revelation? <laughs> no, I, I mean, <laughs> hmm. Hmm. I don't know. You know, no, I mean, obviously not. And it's just like, because why would they? They can just do this with impunity now. I mean, and, and obviously they've been able to do this for a long time but it used to be that they at least had to pretend they at least had to make a show they used to they if they really wanted to tell a lie they would do like a cover-up and they would you know like an extensive cover-up but now they can just lie and then if you know when the truth inevitably comes out they can just suppress it and they don't have to issue a correction they used to do these things where they would you know tell a lie in an article and then put it in like put a retraction and like fine print at the bottom of the page a few days later or something they don't even do that anymore they don't have to because who is going to yeah, who's going to make them do that yeah and there's not going to even be an apology i mean the new york times retracted its article which said that brian sicknick was murdered by a fire extinguisher i think they published that in january and like all these media outlets kept saying he was murdered he was murdered he was murdered by these capital protesters and not a single one of them is going to issue a serious correction or retraction and they're not going to apologize for this. This is already in people's heads. And even when I was saying this and like in replies I was looking at when this news was announced is that all these libtards were just saying, well, he definitely this was this was the stroke was caused by the protest and it doesn't matter he was still attacked and they injured all their officers and this still threatened our democracy and it doesn't matter how he died and we think he died. And even some people were saying like, oh yeah, he still took a fire extinguisher to the head. It doesn't matter. Like these lies are gonna be repeated 
in the history books. It's the same with like Trayvon Martin was shot in the back. No, he wasn't. All the evidence points out he was not shot in the back. He was shot in self-defense. It doesn't matter. It's still going to go down that he was shot. He was just a poor little innocent boy walking home who was gunned down by an evil white supremacist uh, Hispanic uh, in the back. In the back, and it's the same white with Hispanic, Michael Brown. Yeah. Michael Brown had his hands up and was on his knees when he was gunned down by a police officer. Department of Obama's Department of Justice found that was completely untrue. It doesn't matter. That's what people are going to remember it. And so, what people are going to remember is that. The Trump protesters murdered Brian Sicknick in cold blood, and they actually murdered the other four, too, even though those were Trump supporters, too, except for Ashley Babbitt. She was about to blow up the whole Capitol with her back. Yeah, she apparently. was wearing a backpack. She deserved so it. She too. had to be shot. Yeah, she had Which to be executed. So they actually, they, these people think that they should have been mowing down all these protesters. Yeah. They would support it. And you can tell by the replies to anything that mentions the harsh treatment uh, dealt to these Trump supporters in jail. Like they support solitary confinement, they support, like, uh prison guards beating them they definitely fantasize about like other prisoners sodomizing them so mm -hmm. this is uh there's there's no reason to stop they're in power and they can make up these lies as they go and uh you know they know that history will reflect their lies only only a few people will remember the truth unfortunately um, unless we win but unless we win then we can correct the record and we can mm -hmm. celebrate uh brian sicknick was murdered by libtard so that'll be in the real <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> in the real uh, in the real textbooks, but it's it's, it's it, you know compare how Brian Sicknick is treated as a murder victim versus that other Capitol Hill police officer who was murdered, who was actually murdered a, uh, like a, two weeks ago by a Nation Islam supporter. That's treated as an accident, even though that guy yeah, clearly ran into him and directed and tried to kill him. It's like he was hit by a car. Like, oh, no. Like, he was just like, yeah, he just got accidentally hit by a car. That's Those are literally true. the headlines. Capitol Police yeah, Officer so, hit by car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that like, was, like, directed at him for the purpose yeah, was of like killing Maxim him. Yeah, like Overdrive happened. Is like the car just gained, uh, sent, you know, became uh, human. It gained its own willpower and just ran over this poor police officer. It was just an accident. Um, but, you know, at the same time that they're, uh, you know, not giving up the Brian Sicknick lie, they're also not giving up the lie about another officer, Derek Chauvin, who is going is likely to face his final verdict this week in the George Floyd murder trial. Uh, you know, I just want to get your initial thoughts on what do you think? How do you think the trial is going? What effect <laughs> do you think it's going to have on the public perception? Because this is another thing that we, you know, talking about a narrative is that, and no matter what the facts are, everyone believes that this officer killed Brian, or I almost called him Brian Sicknick, George <laughs> Floyd, by putting his knee on his neck and, mm -hmm. and suffocating him. And nothing, and people will say, oh, he was not on drugs. Uh, he was a good person. Uh, he, he wanted to be a Supreme Court justice at the age of 46 with no college education, but he was going to do it. And, <laughs> you know, this is the perception they have of George Floyd. But do you think that the trial is in any way uh, changing that? Um, I think, you know, it's like very unfortunate that this event, you know, there's a lot of like political stuff where you can say, hmm, what will be the effect of this? But it's a lot of times it's just normalizing certain political rhetoric and stuff like Trump or that type of thing. But this is like a guy's life. This guy's life is on the line in more ways than one, you know, he either goes to jail for life, you know. I doubt that that uh, that if he actually killed somebody and it wasn't a black guy, I doubt that that would warrant like life in jail or what you know. Three hundred years, Derek Chauvin sentenced to three hundred years for killing George Floyd. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it's like this is somebody's life that we're talking about. But on one hand, it's like if he gets off, like his no, there's no way that if he gets acquitted or anything, which I don't know if you will, but um, no way that that would make people say, oh, wow, I guess that we were wrong. It's it's a lot like the news media. People just lie and they're willing to accept the lies and believe them and nothing will ever change it. And so if he gets off somehow or if they don't give him the punishment that the public thinks that he deserves for having a tiny little Grinch heart, like the defense or like the prosecution argued, then we're just going to have more riots, more uh, cities burning down, which will probably lead to more criminals getting shot, which will lead to, you know, this cycle all over again. Um, but if he does go to jail, then it just further cements, like you talked about earlier, we're just like not going to have the right to trial by jury anymore. 
we are just going to move to this, you know, whatever befits the uh, whatever befits this political establishment, the political agenda, however public um, opinion can be uh, manipulated to serve that. That's just going to be what trials are now. And so it's if he goes to jail, it'll be bad because it's he's losing his life for something that he didn't do. Uh, but it'll also be bad because I think that'll just be a huge, huge, huge step towards that where it's basically just a total show trial. And that's where we've been going for a long time. They weren't able to get uh, Aaron Wilson or, or Zimmerman or any of these guys. So I don't know. I, I'm The long-term consequences of him, for our society, of him going to jail would be really bad. I don't know which one's worse, that or you know just more... Open violence. I think, him, I think him going to jail is worse because it's almost you're tearing off a band aid with him yeah. getting acquitted, and it's like a it's it's a it's a victory for the truth. And even in this trial, if you look at the closing arguments, I you know I didn't I I paid attention to most of the trial, mm -hmm. but not incredibly close attention. But I watched all the closing arguments, and the prosecutors were basically saying that George Floyd had a right to resist arrest because he felt the squad car was too small, mm -hmm. and it's like what well. well what were they supposed to bring out? Like a truck for him? Like what? Yeah, a U-Haul like, box truck. Like a com like a with a couch. Like a, the most comfortable trunk for it. And it's like, yeah. I mean, and these police officers have deal with every day. Nobody wants to get arrested. So they, there's uh, people always try any excuse to get arrested. And this guy is being violent. He's screaming, and he's a big dude. And you know he could do a lot of damage to those officers. And they put him in, and they put him in a position where they could control him. Now, I think the argument you could say is maybe you should have let off the knee. Maybe that knee pressure, uh, which even in some of the videos showing that it's more on a shoulder blade than on his neck, maybe that might have contributed to his heart failure. But you know, I don't think that this was like murder. I mean, it was like a most uh, you know manslaughter. But I don't even think it. I don't even really think it was that because it's like you have a suspect who's out of control, who's like high on drugs. And he's acting erratically and you don't, and he's being and like criminals all the time say like, oh, I can't breathe. Oh, I'm claustrophobic. Oh, I'm having a medical emergency. Like cops deal with this all the time. And usually they're not dealing with a medical emergency. And it probably hit like George Floyd due to the, the fact he like consumed all these drugs right before the police uh, happened upon him, you know, decided to, cons uh, you know, overdose. So I think. Uh, but the general facts, like people aren't going to see the general facts. They're going to see George Floyd as this noble creature, this noble individual who they'll overlook the fact that he committed an armed robbery against a pregnant woman and put a gun to her womb. And they'll overlook the fact that he was like on drugs and he was sitting in a car with his drug dealer and many other things. And they just want to uh, subscribe to this narrative. I think, uh, you know, to any sensible person, and as I think that the defense attorney, uh, Eric Nelson, made a good case for, to any sensible person, you would see that Chauvin's behavior was reasonable in this context, and so were that of the other officers. And I don't think we'll necessarily get a straight up not guilty verdict because I don't think no matter what evidence you could present to some of these black jurors, I don't think they'll like ever say like uh, guilty or not mm -hmm. guilty. Uh, but I think we will have a few people who will insist on the truth and we'll have a hung jury and Chauvin will be let off for the time being and it will uh, create a, you know, a hell storm. <laughs> I think, I think the best case is acquitted and riots because I think, mm -hmm. and whatever happens, because I think more sensible people need to wake up to how this country is. Yeah. And I think if people see this as like, you can't if like the truth prevails like people who use violence to suppress and it's the same reason why you know all these people are threatening riots to these jurors you know uh you know maxine waters is threatening the jurors even even the, the president of the united states is saying that the jurors better get the right verdict because there's overwhelming evidence even though unlike maxine waters he didn't specifically say what the right verdict is but everyone knows what that is and this is how justice is carried on in this country. It just matters to what the media and liberal elites think and want, and that's that's justice. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the police officers are the ones who are going to be most screwed over this. But I don't even know why you would be a police officer anymore. I think yeah, it's I like know, we're, we're we're really going to see the Chauvin trial, no matter what happens. Like it, it's going to be a, it's going to. I, I mean. The George Floyd video going viral was a turning point in American history. 
And uh, it's a it's a true turning point, USA. You could even say, <laughs> um, and this trial will just be a mark of it. Like no matter what happens, we're going to be entering a decade where we're going to have a higher crime, declining quality of life, and the only way to get around it is or to overcome it is to get over this um, bullshit norms and <clears throat> and thought that we live in, like. The country, the America, the 1950s. We live in a very different country now. We live under an empire. We live under an empire, and the boot heel of the empire is on our necks, uh, and and it's pressing down on us far more than Derek Chauvin's knee was pressing down on George Floyd. So right, that's yeah, uh, I that's can't my closing breathe. thoughts. Any <laughs> final thoughts on the trial or George Floyd or Chauvin? Um. Well, uh, yeah, no, I I totally agree, and I think because you know you, you look back several years ago with Trayvon Martin, for example, and maybe people who just kind of, even if they're not, you know, like, quote, like politically like based or whatever, there were people back then who kind of just could intuitively get what was going on. But for the most part, to get the real information, you had to like really look for it to find out like what's what was really going on because everybody else was just told the lies you know he was he just had skittles he just wanted he was just a kid he just wanted skittles and and some sweet tea uh, and he just got shot execution style in the back of the head by this white supremacist you used to have to go on 4chan or whatever to like really keep up with the details but the way that it is now it's like almost every day that there's this new viral or semi-viral video of some white person being accosted by uh, a minority and they like you know with a firm voice they're like stop go away and then it's like racism 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 and then we find out a day later that this person was like you know uh, mentally unstable attacking women you know throwing rocks at chill whatever the case is and now that information is a lot more accessible so i think Kind of like you said, with the riots and stuff, which will happen again, more people will eventually start to say, okay, this is not okay. We cannot allow this to continue. And I think that as these videos continue to become more and more frequent and more and more accessible to normal people, I think that people will just not want to be the next guy to get caught on camera for like, you know racism whatever that is yeah you know, being just, a good neighbor yeah literally <laughs> just looking being, out for being an yeah. aggressive cop they just yeah. like want to roll on by like not my problem but the one i mean i do you know we uh we always get a little too black coat on the show but i do want to offer the white pill as you said you know the the ability to find the truth is easier than ever before even with the tech censorship and with all the suppression and the demonization that we face compared this to like a, or even with the Trayvon Martin case, when that case first happened, you could not find easily accessible information about the truth about Trayvon when that happened. Now, when a case like that happens, you can find on the day of the truth about, uh, about mm -hmm. this. I mean, we already knew the truth about a large part of the truth about George Floyd the day it happened. We knew this guy was a scumbag. We knew this guy like had a criminal record. We knew this guy was likely on drugs. Like all those facts were established within the first week. It took a long time for for Trayvon Martin for a lot of the truth emerge, and a lot of conservatives and believed that story for months. And it wasn't until like you know the Daily Caller and other places were reporting on like what was really happening. So I want to say that that is a white pill that the truth will still get out there. The problem is is many people are too are blind to the truth and they close their ears to it so and mm -hmm. ears and eyes so don't want to mix my and this all there. and this all comes back to the saxon has to wake up the anglo-saxon <laughs> has to wake saxon up Saxon is sleeping he needs to wake up hey wake your up your alarm saxon. clock's going off hey man your alarm clock is going off he's you know he's on a content creator timeline yeah. he's sleeping throughout the day <laughs> as many of the uh fellow content creators uh, sleep into like 5 30 uh, p.m uh you know I, me and jake lloyd are not like that though so no not like just, that but we want to move on to some happier topics or at least some funny things there's three funny stories i just want to briefly uh review before getting on to the patron question uh, the first is uh josh mandel who is a um i've talked about him before he's a, an ohio senate candidate he's a republican he's um 
I've said this before. He's almost like a 2010 Stephen Colbert caricature of what a Republican Senate candidate would see, be. He was like always talks about Muslim terrorists and Mexican mm. gangbangers. <laughs> and like he had like an event where it's like burn your mask. He just like goes over the top and it's so inauthentic. It's like a way like, oh, I want to appeal to the like m the most fevered and, and histrionic boomer commenters of Breitbart. And I mm -hmm. think this is how we'll do it. Uh -huh. Well, he recently uh, did this. He had some posts on Facebook or Twitter that got censored. So he wrote a whole a newspaper column about how he's combating cancel culture. And the first sentence is, as the grandchild is the grandchild of of Holocaust survivors, and you're like, oh god, this, Bro. what is this going to move to? And he's like, <laughs> I feel like I'm suffering similar oppression from big tech. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And then he's like, to show my opposition. I'm going to put parentheses around my name. And it's like, <laughs> this is like total, like, it's like a 2016 alt-right parody video that this guy wrote as a column. It's like, this is all in the first paragraph. It's like, wh what message are you saying? Like, how can you compare, like, the Holocaust to you getting, like, s s censored by Facebook? Like, and, like, and everyone's automatically rolling their eyes at, like, a grandchild of Holocaust survivor. And then you go in and, like, you're, I'm putting parentheses around my name. It's like, you're literally returning to 2016. Like, that is five years ago. Like, what are you doing now? And that's also what now? Jewish journalists did on Twitter. <laughs> like, liberal journalists. Yeah, that's They're what like, well, look, a bunch I'm of conservatives Jewish. did it, too. There was actually some weird conservatives, like um, Mark Krikorian of C Center for Immigration Studies. He does pretty good work. He left his name in parentheses, and he's not Jewish. He's Armenian. Uh, he left his name for parentheses till like, 2018. There were several other people who do it, too. Like, the only people who keep parentheses around their names are just some weird conservatives. But, like, w what does this accomplish? But I, I think the, the point, you know, uh, there's a lot of criticism of J.D. Vance, and I think uh, I've said this before in podcasts, and I'm pretty sure Jake Lloyd uh, shares it, is that, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical of Jake, uh, J.D. Vance. But compared to the rest of the field in Ohio, he is the best candidate. Uh, he's still cringe, but... Uh, you know, Josh Mandel is too much of a clown to ever win. Yeah. And uh, Jane Timken is too established. There's somebody who's even worse. I forget his name. I think it's like Marino. It's something Hispanic who's like a, who is like a never, who's like anti-Trump in like 2019. And he's just like business first. And he's like probably the worst. Um, but compared to with everyone else, I think J.D. Vance is uh, the best candidate. I think Jane Timken might even be better than Mandel, but uh, there's yeah, many the races thing, keep up with think but. about JD Vance. I just uh, you know the reason I'm like not super con you know because it's like yeah he sucks for a lot of reasons that you know I mean basically everybody knows at this point, but it's like he's not he's not really charismatic or good looking enough to like usurp the populist energy from like us basically so i don't think that that's I'm true not, i'm not very concerned good looking about. <laughs> and very charismatic and so are you jake everybody <laughs> that comes on the highly respected podcast you have to be every single person is incredibly good looking and incredibly charismatic who's ever come on um, <laughs> highly respected before that's 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 fact check you can fact check that and that'll be come back as 100 percent true um but yeah no i i actually agree at that point he doesn't really have the power to really supplant trump uh, from the Trumpist mantle. Like mm -hmm. they keep wanting to have like a nice guy Trumpism. I think even that problem applies to, uh, to Ron DeSantis. I've said this in other podcasts. Like I like a lot of what Ron DeSantis does. I like his agenda. I like what it, you know, he's saying all the right things, but he just does not have that charisma. He doesn't have that uh, missing power. He doesn't have that power that Trump has. And, you know, <clears throat> maybe he may be a more competent, I mean, he probably is a more competent administrator. <laughs> <laughs> and like to maybe get more things done than Trump. But in terms of like electrifying that middle America, like he just can't do it. And of course, Shady Vance right. can't do it either. Um, but yeah, that's that's still a race we're going to keep an eye on. But the, I want to keep, you know, the positivity flowing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also one of the funniest videos I've seen in a long time. Besides the next video I'm going to talk after this. Is uh, Antifa in Portland may have finally crossed the line. They uh -oh. uh, they attacked a Popeyes. No, and <laughs> they they vandalized it, and people are outraged by it. Uh, a local news crew interviewed some blacks about it, and they had had enough of the Antifa violence. They're like, "I've been going here since I was a baby," and they 
they don't need to go do this. <laughs> and they're so <laughs> upset about the Popeyes uh, getting vandalized. And it's also like, why the hell are Antifa vandalizing a Popeyes? Like, I right. don't understand. Like, what? what? <laughs> but it really <laughs> pissed off you know actual black people like that's mm -hmm. like the funny thing with it it's like the the actual black lives are affected by the destruction of the of the pop of the portland popeyes and uh i tweeted out this video so you should all watch it, it it's um it's definitely uh it's definitely a funny watch uh, maybe Antifa may be moving over the line. I think there, there is some cases of this where in Minneapolis and other places where some of the black protesters are having enough with Antifa, but uh, I don't really like making that distinction. Uh, last year, when these riots first broke out, a lot of conservative people and MAGA people were like saying like, oh, Antifa and Black Lives Matter are, are, are different. Like we, sub we support Black Lives Matter, but we're opposed to Antifa. And they did this in a way of like, uh, PC judo, like they're like, well, like we are only opposed to the white people destroying stuff. But uh, like most of, uh, I made this distinction before. I mean, all the looting and stuff is done primarily by blacks, but most of the like destruction of like federal property and fighting with police is done by white Antifa. Mm -hmm. And even in the, some of the cases we saw, I think we were talking about this earlier, is that, you know, the guy who is, uh, who was arrested by police for confronting a BLM mob that was took over his neighborhood in suburban Minneapolis. You know, that whole mob was black. That was no white Antifa there, but. Right. <laughs> so you don't want to make this distinction, but I do think some ordinary blacks, if they do, you know, if you do attack their Popeyes into their, uh, their restaurants that they like, and in <laughs> Portland, it is pretty much all white people. I will like, I will, or yeah. like some of them are like mysterious. Like you look at some of these pictures and like, I have no earthly idea what this person is. Um, you know, they're uh, mystery Americans. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I understand in that case, but I don't. You you shouldn't fall into the uh, to the mis uh, the trap of thinking there's a distinction between Black Lives Matter and Antifa. They're on the same page, even though Black Lives Matter would never target a, a Popeyes. So yeah. that's one thing. But the last funny topic. It's we'll, like we'll uh, just... it's like in it's like in uh, Afghanistan. You hear these stories, or or like Iraq or something. You hear these stories of like the like British people call in a, an airstrike on a position and they accidentally kill American. They like got the coordinates mixed up and they, they hit the wrong target. They're like, no, <laughs> cancel, cancel, cancel. They're yeah, I <laughs> friendly I fire. An apology for uh, destroying yeah. the Popeyes. Yeah. <laughs> that would make this all much better. I hope, I hope Antifa issues an official statement uh, apologizing for the for the Popeye's destruction, but we'll have to see. But the last funny thing, this is even funnier than all the past videos I was talking about, is that um, it's it's uh, it's similar. It's unintentionally funny. Is that Lynn Wood spoke at what I can only call as QAnon stock uh, last weekend? It was the Health and Freedom Conference. I think it was hold it held in uh, Oklahoma. It was it is ostensibly just supposed to be a normal conservative conference, but it was really like a QAnon <laughs> gathering. Uh, <laughs> under like a cover of like the benign health and freedom conference and he gave this speech that i can only say is the funniest thing i've ever heard it's not supposed to be funny it's um just like the kind of crazy shit he just says and the way he rips up whips up a crowd like i've said this before about uh, you know lynn wood if he wasn't totally insane <laughs> and like you know going down rabbit holes he maybe should like he'd probably be actually the natural successor to trump just the way he can he can like electrify a crowd and be charismatic and he's up there and he's like talking like a uh, like a mega church pastor and he's like up there he's like drawing cue is that that's a cue Ooh. <laughs> and he's like talking about let me tell you the obamas send this video to the obamas send it to the bushes send it to the Bidens. we're not going to tolerate killing children and he's like this is a crime against humanity and the penalty for a crime against humanity is death and the whole crowd <laughs> goes crazy he's like, Take them out. And just like, <laughs> that's nuts. so funny. And these, oh, like, man. I mean, like, if I was a libtard, I'd probably be terrified because it's like, uh, these people may actually do something. <laughs> like, and like, uh, you know, he literally, he's me, like, like an like, old I, circuit 
revival with preacher it's oh it's so, totally like open. billy Dude, sunday there's so many he also declared that trump is still president <laughs> 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 like, like i think for most people who are smart and sensible realize that this is like not true so there's no like uh, most of it's not true so they just take it as like entertainment is like good content which is like mm -hmm. When you when you take uh you know this is like a 2019 meme, but when you take the clown pill or the clear pill as some people now call it, you know you kind of understand that this is just uh, <laughs> it's just all good. <laughs> it's just like funny, but I mean it's like this guy he, the way he's the besides Trump, I have not seen any person on the right work up a crowd like Lynn Wood. And even before, like, he went totally crazy. When I was, like, watching him speak in some of these rallies uh, last year, you know, during the initial Stop the Steal stuff, I was like, this guy could run for office. Like, this guy could be it. But, I mean, he's uh, – I think he went too uh, far out in left field to uh, – Too many red pills. Ever be. I mean, and he's, like, talking about, it's like, they're harvesting the blood of the children. They're taking them out. Ah, we will not stand for it. And he's like doing this. I don't know how a campaign of uh, of calling every Republican a satanic um, molester uh, in the right district. You never work. know. In the right district, he might have a good chance. <laughs> well, he, I think he wants to be GOP chairman of South Carolina. I don't know how that will work, but uh, we'll see. But I think, you know, besides this being funny, good content, and like you guys should watch it and like, it really um, horrifying lib liberals. I think, you, you know, this is one thing like bringing back J.D. Vance is that a lot of people think like the future of Trumpism is like Trumpism without Trump is like some respectable, like economic policy. Like we're just trying to help out working class whites with like an industrial policy. And we're we're not about racism anymore. We're just like about like economic nationalism. And like the Lynn Wood QAnon stock shows like the, the other side, the complete other side of Trumpism that really electrifies the crowd. And it's talking about like executing satanic blood drinking globalists. <laughs> and like this is what's really getting up. Like you could just put like J.D. Vance like talking about industrial policy and blah, blah, blah. And people give a golf clap. And then you bring out Lynn Wood who's like, I got a warrant for George W. Bush. Penalty, fire squad, <laughs> and like the crowd would just go like go nuts. Like that, like that. That's like how you could see like the Trump base. If you had like a normal Trump rally and you put like JD Vance there, like the crowd would give golf flaps. They'd try to take a nap. You put like Lynn Wood, they pro they may go crazier for him than they would Trump himself. So this does like illustrate. I don't necessarily think this is necessarily a good aspect of the Trump base, but it is a necessary uh, aspect about the Trump base is that. They are do connect with these more controversial sides of the issue, and they, and they, there is like a strong moral undertone to QAnon. Like they are literally at war against the worst possible evil you could imagine, and that does have a powerful moral narrative right. for these people. Uh, I of course <laughs> think it's completely insane and totally made up, but I mean, even though there is like, of course, elites are doing bad things, but I don't necessarily think it's on the level of QAnon. Uh, but, you know, that really connects with people in a way that, you know, the respectable, nice guy <laughs> Trumpism doesn't. Yeah. And I, this is something that, like, the J.D. Vances and the American Moment and the Orrin Casses don't understand is that Lynn Wood is closer to the Trump base than they will ever be. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that's something to keep in mind. I don't necessarily think you should go down the Linwood route. Uh, I mean, some of it is just that he's just a charismatic, electrifying speaker and he knows how to appeal to people. I mean, this guy was like a was like an incredible trial lawyer. So he knows how to talk to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something to keep in mind. Maybe it's just something with charisma or maybe it's something that like you have to offer like a strong moral narrative and with like good guys and villains and it's like simplified and you are able to make people believe that they're in the fight for their lives. <clears throat> and I don't think the respectable Trumpism really does that. But the uh, <laughs> QAnonism uh, unfortunately does. I mean, in some ways it yeah. delivers good content, but at the same time, we don't want these people... Uh, uh, it's ultimately politically fruitless. Well, it's an, it's encouraging to see, I think, because these people probably 10 years ago, I mean, how many of these people like 10 years ago were watching Alex Jones and listening to like David Icke about like 
you know, blood sucking, adrenochrome pedophile government officials or a, you know aliens or this type of stuff. Most of them probably weren't. Most of them were probably, you know, voting for Mitt Romney and thinking that that was going to fix things. You know, we just got to get Obama out of it. Maybe they, maybe, maybe most of them, like at at best, like kind of had like an Obama birther streak or something like that. Yeah. But there was just enough. The enough happened over this period of time, over this past decade. Enough happened that push these people into this crazy mental space now where that's the world that they live in. Now, of course, we don't, the good thing about that is that it shows that everybody does kind of have a limit of like what it takes to push them to, to, to push them politically. And the good thing is that we don't have to push the most of the population into that degree of, of, you know, craziness. Actually, in fact, we don't want most people in that in that world. So we don't have to push as far and things are getting crazier and crazier. And so I think that as like you mentioned over the next decade or so, lawlessness will increase and stuff. And so I think that as that continues and as government tyranny continues, I mean, look at the stuff with the masks, uh, what that's done to people over the past year. So as these things continue, I think that uh, we'll just see more people uh, waking up, more people taking the red pill um, and just not going as far as QAnon, hopefully. So I think that hopefully. that's encouraging. It's always, I, I always like to see that stuff because I've been in this, not working in this stuff. I mean, because 10 years ago I was a, like, a teenager but when i was a kid i was listening to alex jones and stuff and you know definitely there were not there were definitely not a lot of people who were who i could have said those things to and they would have like not thought that i was you know crazy or whatever and now it's a lot of it's mainstream <laughs> like maybe that's <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe so, that's what <laughs> maybe maybe that's a bad that we'll have to think but uh, the last point i want to say is that like <clears throat> all the people at this conference looked like normal people it looked like a pta meeting like mm -hmm. that's like the weird like it was like normal boomers there who were just like uh, and boomer moms like it was like overwhelmingly i think most of that crowd was female at least in the background it was like mostly female and that's not something you would have seen like in right wing events in the past. There's something very unique. I think QAnon is primarily like all well, like middle aged women yeah. or like women, not necessarily like it's probably like women who are at least 35 to like 70. Mm -hmm. And that's like a very unique demographic to serve as like the core nexus of a right. I wonder movement. if it's like their motherly instinct. They they hear that somebody's trying to steal their baby to s suck its blood, and they they activate. No, we well, say I think no. It, well, pedophilia is the last taboo that everyone's allowed to hate, and mm -hmm. people, it's like, and people really hate this stuff. And if you truly believe that they're like you know, butchering babies and kids doing terrible things to them, then you would like want to do something about it. You would gravitate towards people like Lynn Wood. So, um, that's something to consider. Uh, but moving on, finally. To our patron questions, this we've got a twofer from one person today. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me or a guest questions if you sign up for the patron option at highly respected patron Patreon. This one comes from Winston. He asks, and we I'm glad we got a good guest on for this. This is the first question he's asked: Is do you think you can explain people on the to people on the right's fascination with Orthodox Christianity? On a related note. Do you think you can explain Tradcast Twitter's disdain for Luther and the Reformation and why they act like it was the worst event in history? Uh, this Winston wanted Blep Sama to answer these questions, but he got Jake Lloyd and said, and I actually thought that Blep would have been too hardcore on this and offended too many people. <laughs> so instead, we got the more moderate uh, Jake Lloyd. I can answer the first question. I'll probably let um, Jake Lloyd take off more for the second him being a devout Protestant and wanting to defend Martin Luther. Uh, the first question is like why people get into Orthodox Christianity. I mean, that's the same thing is it's similar to why people get into tr traditional Catholicism. It's like, it's a, it's a religion that's seen that has a long tradition. It's, it's conservative, <laughs> you know, it's ornate. It represents like the past, like the glories of the past. And like people like the aesthetics and Orthodox. I think the people like go that additional step, from traditional Catholicism is because they don't like the Vatican and they don't like the hierarchy. 
uh, you know, that's going on with the Catholic Church. They don't like the abuse scandals. And it seems like the Orthodox Church is shorn of a lot of the things that uh, people associate negatively with the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, it goes to additional stuff. I find like Orthodox, you know, I know a lot of our listeners are Orthodox Christian and people, you know, have the right to choose whatever uh, religion they feel uh, best fits them. You know, some people may not like that, but I'm more ecumenical in my regards to religion, non-sectarian. Um, but I, in my personal experience, I find Orthodox Christianity like foreign in my, I find it something that's very, um, yeah. Definitely not something that, that like I can relate to. I find it too much, too extravagant, but too exotic uh, for me. And even like the the standards they have, it's like much harder uh, than Catholicism. And I mean, especially the Catholicism practiced by most American uh, Catholics. Uh, so I think that's why people gravitate towards it. I think they, you know, they get so alienated with what they see in the mainstream of Catholicism and mainstream Protestantism that they turn to what is considered like the most hardcore version of traditional Christianity, which they think is orthodoxy. And, you know, um, people feel that that captures their needs and they it's where they belong and, uh, you know, more power to them. So that's my thoughts on that. Um, with Luther, I mean, it's it's a pretty easy um, answer. I mean, they think that the Reformation is the worst thing. And some of this comes from right-wing reactionary <clears throat> authors like uh, Demistra and Evola. And they always think it's like the Reformation is where everything went wrong. I don't really share that opinion. Um, but, you know, they kind of imagine that all of Europe would have been better as like under the one church. But there was a lot of problems before, uh, you know, the Reformation. And the Reformation happened because all these secular princes were tired of dealing with the church's authority. And a lot of the ways the church's authority was not acting in a, in a good manner. And the secular princes decided just to... Uh, uphold Protestantism as a way of counteracting what they thought was the harmful influence of the church or the overbearing influence of the church. And that's how uh, Lutheranism spread in Germany. That's why Henry VIII uh, turned to pro became a Protestant. And um, I don't really think it is the worst thing in the world. I, I, I understand why Catholics do, because they want like everyone, at least all of Europe, to be Catholic. And they felt that Luther was guided by Satan in his, cor in his uh, <laughs> course to uh, dismantle that. But I'll give you, you know, Jake, what do you think? Uh, what are your thoughts on those two questions? Yeah, it's kind of it's funny that that uh, between Anglo-Saxon, the Anglo-Saxon topic and this, it's like this. I was made for this moment, I guess. <laughs> but because uh, it's, made it's for this like highly respected episode defending <laughs> like Anglo's and like railing against trad cath is that's like my whole Twitter personality nowadays. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so uh, yeah, so just uh, disc to like a pref to preface this, if I say anything that like offends the listener, you think, hey, that's not me, then it's like, okay, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about a very particular uh, pathologies, basically, cultural pathologies. Um, so like with the orthodoxy, I definitely agree. I think it's like a, it's an alien cultural presence like it's not that's not american it's not whatever and so of course yeah if it's just true then follow the truth but if it is true then you know christianity historically does not try to like there's a reason that throughout europe they aren't practicing like something that looks middle eastern where christianity started which is not the case with islam it's not the case with eastern orthodoxy the way that it is now christianity is adaptable to the cultural sensibilities of the place you know to an extent as long as it's not like you know we'll want to kill people and you know find gold in their heads or whatever um but <laughs> I, yeah, I, wanted, so, uh, but I wanted to briefly interrupt i think it's uh most of this is directed towards orthodox converts i know there's a lot of people who are like greek and serbian and russian yeah yeah like yeah that, this and is, ukrainian this is, yeah. that's actually their culture if that's so your culture wanna... then fine yeah if that's your yeah. culture then that's understandable and that makes sense but i think that um the or converting to orthodoxy the reason that so many americans do it uh i don't know so much about europeans but i think that it's it's similar to what we were talking about earlier with the reason that people want to identify with being Irish or being German when they are in fact not all that Irish or German. It's just because they're deracinated from the culture that they live in. They don't feel that they have any culture. They don't understand it and therefore they can't appreciate it. And so they go looking for 
a culture and they want something rich. And so they see that and they think that's a very rich culture and they uh, are obviously convinced of its truth claims also, and that's fine. Uh, and so that's, that's the draw for it. I think that it's kind of like a similar thing. Like if people weren't like, if they weren't Christians, then maybe they would like become Hindus or something like that. It's, I think of the cultural, obviously not the truth claims, but the cultural aspects in kind of a similar way. So that's what I think about the Orthodox conversion question. What was the thing? Oh, the trad, it was, was it, why do trad cats hate Trads Luther? Hate Luther. Um, yeah, it's because they like, don't, they don't understand history. They don't understand the history of Europe. They don't understand the history of the church. They don't understand the history of the Reformation or what happened. They don't even understand modern day Protestantism. And so Luther just becomes this, this boogeyman bad guy. That's, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, and bad, yeah. basically they don't get it because like you mentioned, this is something that a lot of people like, he's like, um, how can I break my vows? I know I will destroy the true church of Jesus Christ. And that's not what happened. And they say the same thing. There are Henry legitimate too. Right. They, yeah, they're like, he just, he just, <laughs> you know, he coomer, coomer like, you know, and of course he was like, there are some like, he's trying. And, and you think about the political, the, uh, you know, the tutors were a product of that. They were able to put that to bed. He's like, I have to have a son in, or else we're going to go back to that arguments for, for and others who are, I won't go further into that because that's you know not really what we're here to talk about. But they just don't understand. They don't understand really any of the history. It's like I was arguing with somebody the other day on Twitter because it comes from Rome. We should be thanking the Italians. And it's like, of course, who is saying this? But like, and you know, it's it's just you don't get it. Like if you if you think those things, you don't get it, and that's okay. But you know, look into it. That's what I would say. Okay. I don't know. That was kind of those kind some... of a rambling, rambling thoughts, but that's you know that's what happens when I you know deal with get assaulted <laughs> with these things all day long on Twitter. Yeah, I understand. So I think that's a good final note to end on. Jake, anything to any final thoughts or things you would want to promote to the good listeners? Uh, not much to promote. I would just say uh, if you uh, want to, if you don't follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at Jacob C. Lloyd. Uh, you can subscribe to me on Trovo where I've been streaming. I haven't been streaming lately, but I'm going to get back into that pretty soon. Trovo.live slash uh Jacob C. Lloyd. I don't know. Or just slash Jake Lloyd, actually. I don't know if it's not live. Anyway, Trovo. <laughs> go to Trovo. Well, I'm glad Google you got Trovo. it connected, but I'm sure our listeners will try both choices. But yeah. anyway, it's great to have you on, Jake. We'll have to have you on again. Thank you, Scott. It's always a pleasure. And it's uh, my pleasure, actually. <laughs> but also make sure to follow Jake Lloyd on Twitter and Telegram. Uh, Twitter, I think it's twitter.com slash Jacob C. Lloyd. And what is your Telegram? Uh, the, my telegram is t.me slash Jake Lloyd. All right. Well, our listeners will make sure to hit the follow button, but until next time, stay respected. <laughs> <laughs>